It's always good to be at an ISI event uh, for a number of reasons. But I'm reflecting now that uh, this is the fourth time in a row where I have been uh, the last speaker. Um, and the last speaker always has to address a groggy uh, audience. So I understand if you uh, nod off a bit. Uh, all I ask is that you come and shake me if I nod off a bit, <laughs> which is possible. Also, as being the last uh, speaker, I'm the speaker who's closest to the cocktail hour. And uh, I've decided there's a, there, that there must be some reason for this, that uh, ISI organizers must assume that after you hear what I have to say, you need a drink. <laughs> Certainly I will. One of the reasons I love being at ISI events is that ISI takes ideas seriously. They don't turn ideas into doctrines. And they like to deal with competing ideas in conversations. Even if we're lecturing, they're meant to be a conversation among uh, speakers and a set of ideas uh, that, that uh, examine from a variety of point of views. And um, this is, I think, an increasingly important and increasingly rare in our society. We don't have enough uh, of us who take uh, the notion of ideas seriously and don't turn them into doctrines. And we are not, as Santayana once said uh, of the American people, we're not always seeking to persuade and to be persuaded as we used to be. My conversations uh, this weekend began yesterday when I uh, met with an artist and, and uh, documentary maker of, whose work I greatly respect and admire. And uh, I had made the mistake of sending her a copy of my paper ahead of time when she found that I was scandalously conservative and eccentricity, with an eccentricity attached to it. And as we, uh, we began that conversation uh, over several hours trying to understand uh, how out of our different epistemological and ontological assumptions we saw some things alike and some things differently, I came to realize that there are many people who are not at ISI events that I, who I would love uh, to participate in one way or another who don't even understand the categories we operate with and who, uh, who, 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 who couldn't join the conversation except sort of in the middle. And I hope that uh, ISI becomes even, uh, does even uh, more to get uh, places like Stanford and uh, other universities so they can enrich the conversation with people who are outside uh, the existing conversation. Well, I want to talk today about uh, the question of can the West defend itself? And I come to this question, something as an interloper and an outsider, but I come to it through my reflections on, on Walter Lippmann, who I've been studying for some time, and asking in some ways, how does he fit into this conversation, or how might he enrich our conversation? We cannot answer whether the West can defend itself until we supply a useful definition to the West, and until we determine what might threaten it. By West, I mean the civilization that emerged from the creative tensions of the ancient cities, Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome. Not only is this civilization connected with two of the great religions, Judaism and Christianity, but it also counts as among its peculiar glories the civilizing influence of reason and the technological power of empirical science. It produced a tension-filled epistemological middle way that might be understood as faith-seeking understanding, a general openness to the claims of reason and later science in the context of a widely held belief in a transcendental order. Natural law was perhaps the West's most potent expression of this belief in authority that gives purpose and direction to human life and through which we might judge roughly the quality of a civilization. Western civilization was born in the commercial cradle of the Mediterranean, but over the course of the centuries mingled with many peoples of Europe, taking new forms as Roman ways and Christian beliefs encountered various cultural soils. By the Middle Age, the genus uh, uh, the West contained many species, each with roots both in local cultural soil and the cosmopolitan civilizational order. The collapse of the spiritual canopy of the church, among many other factors, opened Europe to often violent clashes based on competing religions and interpretations. 
In short order, the authority of religion itself would be under threat. The subsequent hope and optimism of the Enlightenment rested on a new configuration of knowledge and authority. In the new conquering empire of light and reason, a promised liberation heretofore unknown in human history. As a regime of tolerance spread across Europe, promising to quell the violence of a privatizing contentious beliefs about God, a newly powerful science of knowledge offered sturdier forms of knowledge upon which to rest public decisions. Slowly, thinkers exposed to the mathematical language that described the physical universe, offering a universal description of our world that spoke with the predictability of numbers. If the scientific epistemology of the new age, of this new age of knowledge, couldn't explain the cause of the universe, or of life, or of the glorious diversity of life, it could give an, an ever-increasing power to understand how the universe works and promises of ways to turn the natural world toward human designs. Perhaps the, whole, the, world, uh, the human world of culture, economy, and society has similar structure and might yet yield answers to our inquiry. Perhaps beneath culture and history there is a deep and predictable structure to human life, knowledge uh, of which might guide us on how to live well. Maybe humans have finally happened on the methods of inquiry that will supply us with knowledge rather than opinions, and that this body of knowledge can provide us with a rational authority that can conquer the irrationality of competing religious beliefs. These methods might help us transcend cultural difference and establish a universal society. But if this method discovers no purpose or meaning, or teleological structure to human culture and history, then the enterprise to replace religious or natural authority with human and rational authority will collapse. And the thin reed of tolerance, as the belief that safeguards human civility, will be vulnerable to the irrational will to power and to the spiritual innervation that leads to suicidal indifference. Seen this way, the West faced an acute crisis of authority and thereby of coherent meaning and purpose by the early 20th century. The most important means by which the Western culture sustained a, a higher meaning and purpose under such serious threats uh, of the 20th century. First, Europeans found it hard to believe, in sufficient numbers at least, in the two religions that understood history to be a story told by God. A kind of hard historicism, a la Heidegger, stress the irrationality of life itself, the meaningless nature to the course of history, and the loss of any spiritual resources to fight for something higher and something noble. Second, addiction to technology and to human capacity to change their environment placed on, place an emphasis on human change, on technological progress, and on the immediate future. Europeans began to lose their organic ties to their past. Inevitably, they lost their sense of participating in an historical culture that connects the ancient and mythical stories to the distant future through a living chain of generations. They lost, as it were, a soft historicism, a la Burke. They gave their lives meaning and direction as part of a culture, uh, as part of a culture uh, much greater than their individual lives and replaced it with a hard historicism that denied that historical change has any teleological purpose. The 20th century witnessed to engage in a bit of hyperbole the death of the West on the continent of Europe, although maybe it's not hyperbole after what I've heard uh, most recently, leaving at the end of that bloody century a tired civilization that turned to private pleasure and tolerant indifference as the remaining vestiges of a once proud patrimony. The signs of this decay to which so many scholars point today is that, is, is that those in a post-Christian Europe seem almost incapable of recognizing evil as evil. And it seems interest, more interested in protecting their comfortable lives than in risking their lives for something noble. Second, scholars note, as we've heard a couple of times today already in some great detail, Scholars note that Europe is engaging in suicide by demography. Not only have European nations allowed countless mil millions of immigrants 
who do not share their civilization or even the shriveled values of tolerance and pleasure to threaten the very existence of a, as a culturally Western nation, but they have dis displayed so little faith in the future that native Europeans cannot sustain their own populations. The peoples of the continent of Europe, in short, possess none of the defining characteristics of Western civilization that I outlined before. And most importantly, no appeal to a transcendent authority, either faith or reason, can rally them to defend themselves or their civilization. Absent at normative beliefs, Western civilization is empty and castrated. Fortunately, Western civilization was not exclusively a possession of the continent. The West also found unique expressions in London, and then later a final variant in Philadelphia, to use the famous construction employed by Russell Kirk. The Anglo-American version of the West are very different from the continental variants and much healthier. Europe cannot defend itself, but America can, which is to say that the West can defend itself only insofar as Americans defend the West, the West as civilization and the West as idea. If this is true, remember I told you I was engaging in a bit of hyperbole to, to uh, clarify things, but if this is true, then the greatest threat to the West today is the crisis of authority in the United States. The best hope for the United States, meanwhile, is to do two related things. One, the U.S. must focus on its role as a defender of the complex traditions of Western civilization, but now in peculiarly American form. Two, the U.S. must stop evangelizing the world with a spiritually thin version of Western universalism disconnected from encumbering traditions. To put this a different way, the hope of Western civilization is for America to solve its own problem of authority and to reaffirm its cultural inheritance while at the same time not requiring the rest of the world to be like us. The United States must learn to defend its rooted, culturally distinct expression of universal ideas, rather than spread a thin, abstract, and culturally deracinated regime of rights. To understand the problem we face, I want to examine the problem of authority in America from a historical perspective, leaving for you to ruminate at the end about whether this, where this leads us today. I am, after all, a historian. I don't have to answer those questions. And I do think that while many of us have examined similar questions from a different perspectives, there's, there is a different way of thinking about this from a, a political theorist's point of view, from an historical point of view. And I think certain diff, uh, different tensions emerge or bubble up from those different forms of inquiry. A century ago, Henry Adams penned the most beautiful analysis of America's problem with authority. The education of Henry Adams remains one of the greatest minds of historical wisdom. In the most famous chapter, The Dynamo and the Virgin, Adams described how he had haunted the Paris Exposition of 1900. Drawn by an almost religious force, he said, to the great hall of dynamos in search of an object of worship, an authority to give sequence, coherence, and meaning to existence. Adams found an object that inspired worship, but he found no authority, no meaning, and no coherence. In this great engine, the dynamo, that turned coal into electricity, he detected power, but not authority. The dynamo and the technological power it represented suggested only creative power, put to what purposes we might imagine, and for what purposes we have not yet dreamed by our feverish imaginations. Adams, the historian, sought to unearth patterns or sequences that might intimate purposes or designs. By 1900, he despaired of finding meaning, and I quote in one of my favorite passages that I wish I had written. Satisfied that the sequence of men led to nothing, and the sequence of society could lead no further, while the mere sequence of time was artificial and the sequence of thought was chaos, he turned at last to the sequence of force. And thus it happened that after ten years' pursuit, he found himself lying in the great gallery of machines at the great exposition of 1900 
his historical neck broken by the sudden eruption of forces totally new. I have to read part of that again. I just want to hear it. His historical neck broken by the sudden eruption of forces totally new. Think about the, what that's suggesting and what he's saying. Notice the two themes that emerge. The dynamo was about human-controlled power and could speak to no higher authority. And Adams' survey of human history led him to doubt that history has a purpose or in any way suggests that there is a story told by God. His historical neck was broken. By contrast, Adams wrote almost wistfully about the power of the Virgin Mary and the ordered civilization of the Middle Ages. The power of the Virgin is is charismatic beauty that bound the human and the divine, that served as an ordering principle. The Virgin created a cosmian, an ordered universe of meaning that has authoritative source and a meaningful destiny. The unity and purpose uh, of all things inspired the creation of cathedrals as expressions of the beauty of reality and the meaning found in participating in God's universe. And so in 1900, Adams explored the civilizational alternatives represented by the Virgin and the Dynamo. One was force and authority, the Virgin, creating unity, coherence, and structure that gives gives meaning to our collective and individual lives. The other, machine technology, that inspired so much awe, represented multiplicity and chaos, power without cosmic purpose, And this was the force of modernity. As Adams wrote his autobiography in the first decade of the 20th century, his melancholy seemed more European than American. The author was an intellectual crank in an optimistic age. But the book would only be published in 1919, just in time to establish the keynote for the intellectual and spiritual dirge of the 1920s. Nursed in the epistemological optimism of the Enlightenment, modernity had collapsed by the 1920 into modernism, and modernism destroyed more than it created. For a small and sensitive group of intellectuals in the 1920s, they felt as though they inhabited a a civilization largely hollowed out. Among them were the ruins of the civilization, once great, but now spiritually defenseless. From journey, the journey from enlightenment hope to modernist hope, hopelessness was complex and included many paths diverging and converging. Thankfully, the American path was substantially different from the continental path, preserving in new forms some of the greatest accomplishments of Western civilization from the encroaching nihilism, uh, from the encroaching nihilism that had helped plunge Europe into various fascist totalitarian experiments as well as two world wars. The famous American lost generation of the 20s did not really expose the collapse of a Western civilization, an old bitch gone in the teeth, as they assumed. But the spiritual darkness of the lost generation hangs over American civilization as a ubiquitous possibility, a normless nihilism that can open America and the West to a new species of fascism. The European model of tolerance found a very different expression in America, were the prior foundations of freedoms cultivated sturdy habits and dispositions to self-government. The Americans easily resolved the problem of authority in the years following the founding. Less burdened by strict political or religious hierarchy, Americans had long developed the habit of living independently and of accepting uh, the right of their fellows to live by their own lights. As equal members of the sovereign people, Americans felt little angst about allowing others like themselves to believe as they want, vote as they want, participate equally in the exercise of political authority. The peaceful nature of this system rested in part on the sense that civilization, that citizens, I'm sorry, recognize in other citizens a version of themselves. It is easy to trust in the judgments of people who see the world as you do. The synthesis of Protestant beliefs and Enlightenment universalisms contributed to an emerging sense that America represented a city on a hill. With an unquestioned belief about the natural rights and the God who was the author of those rights, Americans could affirm that their individual freedoms 
their tolerance of competing religious beliefs, their affirmation of limited government were part of God's plan for humans. America was a city on a hill because it was natural in the sense that it was best fitted uh, as, design, as people are designed rather than as they are changed by culture or tradition. Befitting a city on a hill, America is a place to be seen so that others can emulate it. But sometimes, given the moral force of beliefs in nature and nature's God, Americans can feel the call to evangelize. And this tendency is one of our greatest dangers. Because Americans understand that their freedoms are natural. Evangelism requires that the, object of, uh, of the object of, objects of evangelism be liberated from inherited forms of hierarchy and other forms of coercion. And once liberated, the freedom that all humans yearn for in their hearts will turn people into Democrats who jealously guard their newly revealed human rights. The city on a hill myth of America has persisted until today. In some ways, it has served as the primary bulwark against the tendency in modernity toward nihilism and fascism on the one side or toward indifference and self-loathing on the other. It preserves a, a belief in authority transcending human will while stressing the moral imperative found in human nature to be free. These are salutary claims, and they represent the strongest alternative to the spiritual indifference of Europe and with it the crisis of authority. But it's unclear how well this myth will serve in the future. We may stop believing in it at all. Or we may seek to evangelize based on it. Either way is deadly for an American exceptionalism that is rooted in a particular or peculiar expression of Western civilization planted on American soil. But for now, we should focus on the crisis of authority that threatens not only the evangelical pulse of our civilization, but more ominously, our willingness to preserve and to defend it. For convenience sake, we should begin in 1859 with the publication of Darwin's The Origins of Species. Among a great many intellectuals, Darwin spawned doubts on the source of authority and raised the prospect that history is not teleological, not purposeful. In a more precise sense, Darwin's natural selection argument allowed thinkers to dispense with the heretofore indispensable story, Genesis. Shed of the creation story, either as fact or as myth, intellectuals could be liberated from all forms of essentialism. Rather than a fixed reality, we live in an unfinished, constantly changing universe. Liberation from a creation turns humans into creators. American philosophers like William James and John Dewey found the open-ended universe intoxicating and empowering. For a great many American thinkers, fixed ideas and all claims to unchanging truths represented the cardinal sin that had plagued the West since Plato, the quest for, uncertain, for certainty. Competing claims to, the, to truth led to innumerable conflicts, to deadening impositions of religious authority, and to a life-denying obsession with the past and with tradition, people like Dewey would argue. If we are liberated from authority, by what light shall we live? Ah, science. Scientific knowledge is not bound by any ancient authority. It pays no homage to tradition. It is empirical and experimental and provides the means to live forward in a constantly changing environment. Because we now understand that reality is fluid, and all parts of it are in a continuous interaction with other parts, the key to both survival and to creating a social, economic, and political environment that satisfies our changing circumstances and needs is the capacity to experiment and to adjust. This way of thinking, therefore, considers claims to fixed knowledge to be dangerous. By hypotheses, we shall live, or perhaps hypotheses will set us free. The new universe of, uh, the, of the pragmatist fostered a new political faith, a political faith in science that proffered new forms of liberation and control. The political impulse was progressivism. 
It is through the works of one of the great young progressives, Walter Lippmann, that I want to try to highlight the existential crisis for this rejection of authority posed for American civilization. A brilliant thinker, educated at Harvard under such luminaries as William James and George Santayana, Irving Babbitt and Graham Wallace, Lippmann was one of the most powerful and persuasive advocates for progressivism. In due course, however, Lippmann would reject both progressivism and its philosophical parent, pragmatism, in favor of a natural law defense of Western civilization. This is why I'm interested in, in uh, Lippmann in some ways. A man who changed his mind several times, which I find not to be a vice, but a virtue in his case, as he, uh, he is a, an atheist who came to embrace in a significant way natural laws. He struggled to find answers to questions he couldn't find answers to. And there's something very compelling about that search. And it's that that I really want to f uh, focus on as we, uh, as we finish uh, uh, this talk. In his 1914 book, Drift and Mastery, Lippmann contrasts the bygone era which uh, with, had traditions and customs and secure religious beliefs. And it governed tolerably well, he argued, a nation of villages. And he contrasted this with a new, industrial, urban, and skeptical society. The beliefs and customs of the village no longer work. The task before the bustling nation was to take conscious control of our destiny. Whereas John Dewey stressed the need for more complete emancipation from inherited ideas and methods, Lippmann, by contrast, lamented that moderns are emancipated from an ordered world, his words. What he would later call the acids of modernity had destroyed authority, destroyed comforting belief, and the capacity to feel at home in this world. The 25-year-old progressive sounded strangely nostalgic when he wrote, and I quote, the loss of something outside of ourselves which we can obey is a revolutionary break in our habits. Never before have we had to rely so completely upon ourselves. No guardian to think for us. No precedent to follow without question. No lawmaker above. Only ordinary men set to deal with heartbreaking perplexity. Not many 25 years speak like that. He goes on. All weakness comes to the surface. We are homeless in a jungle of machines and untamed powers that haunt and lure the imagination. Our ancestors thought that they knew, that they knew their way from birth to eternity. We are puzzled about the day after tomorrow. What nonsense is it then to talk of liberty as if it were a happy-go-lucky breaking of chains? It is with emancipation that the real task begins. And liberty is a searching challenge. Liberty is a searching challenge. For it takes away the guardianship of the master and the comfort of the priest. The iconoclast did not free us. They threw us into the water, and now we have to swim. End quote. Heartily sanguine, Lippmann looked upon the liberation from transcendental authority and from inherited belief as an awesome burden. If Americans are to master their fate, they must employ a, a method of conscious, deliberative control, a method that supplies empirical knowledge. This is the early Lippmann. Making politics and policy into a science, quote, we draw the hidden into the light of consciousness, record it, compare phases of it, notice history, experiment, reflect on error, and over time and with conscious intent, we domesticate the social forces. That was his hope of how to deal with this problem. Lippmann's hope, however, for a science of politics was short-lived. But not his yearning for order. After World War I, Lippmann began a searching critique of democracy, doubting Dewey's faith that either the methods or the spirit of science can animate the general public. Public opinion will never be informed by the empirical knowledge of scientific inquiry, and the public will rarely make choices that are consistent with objective evidence of the expert. If the people lose contact with religious and traditional sources of authority, but they prove incapable of developing the rational discipline of science, the modernity could descend into aimless passion. Fears about the dangerous powers of irrational passions were indeed justified in the 20s. The Great War not only destroyed facile beliefs, 
in inevitable progress, but modernism, which one historian defined as irrationalism tethered to technism, inspired the many alienated peoples of Europe to relish will and passion rather than intellect and reason. The forces of irrationalism remained strong in Europe after the war and the rise of fascism in Italy and the proliferation of fascist and Nazi parties throughout Europe. Fascism seemed to wed the desire to organize society rationally with the technical powers conveyed by science to a will to power and a pagan-inspired cult of solidarity and greatness. Littmann was one of the very few public intellectuals in the 20s to face the, the fascist regime in Italy. While so many progressives found the rigid organization of society and economy as a leap forward in the scientific management of government, Littmann worried about the entire progressive project. In 1929, Littmann found himself in precisely the same spiritual place that Henry Adams had occupied more than a, a quarter of a century before as he stood frightened before the great dynamo. The cult of useful knowledge and technology had focused intellectual attention on the power to change rather than the power to preserve. Adams and Lippmann had both surveyed the modern landscape and discovered that power had taken the place of authority and power and change were refracted in countless directions, destroying any meaningful illusion that we occupy a tidy universe with clear moral laws. But whereas Adams found no escape from this bleak forecast, Giving in to the law of cultural entropy, Littmann penned a brilliant, if elusive, response to the problem of authority. In his 1929 book, Preface to Morals, Littmann turned not to science, as he had in 1914, but to nature. The specific problem that the preface addressed is disillusionment. Throughout the 19th century and into the 20th, the liberal project in America and Europe had been emancipatory the destruction of the idols, the yearning to live free from tyrannical gods and from arbitrary rules. But freedom does not satisfy, he argued, the most basic human needs. Again, Littmann. Yet there remains the wants which orthodoxy of some sort satisfies. The natural man, when he is released from restraints and has no substitute for them, is at sixes and sevens with himself and the world. For in the free play of his uninhibited instinct, he does not find any natural substitute for the acculturated convictions, which, however badly, nevertheless organized his soul, economized his effort, consoled him, and gave him dignity in his own eyes because he was part of some greater whole. The acids of modernity are so powerful that they do not tolerate a crystallization of ideas that will serve a new orthodoxy into which men can retreat. And so the modern world is haunted by a realization which it becomes increasingly less easy to ignore, that it's impossible to reconstruct an enduring orthodoxy and impossible to live well without the satisfactions which orthodoxy can provide. End quote. This is where, once again, Adams had left the problem a yearning for an unbelievable orthodoxy. When Lippmann notes that the asses of modernity had made, progress, had, had made belief in the old gods impossible, he insists that this is not irreligion. This is no rebellion against faith, but it's an incapacity to believe created by the modern conditions. For these lost souls, he says, there's a better way. The alternatives that Adams and the members of the lost generation seemed to see was between utter despair leading to indifference, and a nihilistic will to power. Lippmann offers a third option, humanism. If modernism destroys the ability to believe that a supernatural world stands behind the visible world, humanism responded by acknowledging the human desire for an unchanging normative order. He begins with our desire for something as unchanging, not with the fact of something unchanging. The fact of human desires is the beginning of the humanist enterprise, which seeks to fulfill or complete human nature. The goal of the humanist is to order the soul. Liberalism fails fundamentally at this project because it begins with the childish assumptions that the universe should satisfy our desires, no matter how much our desires proliferate. Therefore, liberals believe that happiness follows the successful transformation of the world to satisfy our, our desires. 
Hence the love for technology and the love for science. But the desires of a childish soul are never satisfied. The humanist responds by saying that happiness follows the transformation not of the world, but of the self. A mature person comes to recognize that the universe does not exist to satisfy his whims. Once he accepts this fact, Lippmann argued, he learns to identify his true needs and to develop the habits and the virtues that help him satisfy his needs in the world that exists rather than the world that he would create. Lippmann turned to the ancients and to religious prophets to point out that the true needs of humans are accessible to humans at all times. And that great thinkers had already developed the morals and the virtues that help the mature person to adjust to circumstances, to be happy with what he has, to be ordered in his soul, and therefore not expect happiness to come from outside of himself. In other words, Lippmann claimed that the best way of life open to humans has long been understood by great thinkers, by spiritually sensitive souls, and that the discipline necessary to live well is not available to the many. It's rare. In pre-modern Europe, custom and authority provided the structure that the immature needed to live tolerably well. Modernity destroyed utterly the context that gave a people, uh, to a people a story that made sense of their existence. Even for those who would be orthodox Christians in this modern age, they must now consciously choose to believe. The modern age no longer allows one not to choose. The effect is that modernity produces a proletariat of the spirit, whereby the many are no longer protected all their lives by custom and authority. The few who have become mature, who can live tolerably well without gods, can do so because they know that morals help satisfy our nature. And to cultivate morals and virtues creates a person who is capable of living well, of living happily, and adjusting to the world rather than expecting the world to adjust to him. But what Lippmann could not answer in this book, 1929, halfway into his career, is how the many could live well once the unquestioned cosmic story has been questioned. In preface... The preface spoke to the few, which is of very little use when the fate of civilization depends on the beliefs of many. In 1955, Lippmann published the last, his last serious work of political thought, The Public Philosophy. But the origins of this book lay in Europe in 1938. Quote, I was filled with foreboding, wrote Lippmann, at the na- this is 38, so he's in Europe when he's writing this, by the way, and he's observing what's happening in Europe. I was filled with foreboding that the nations of the Atlantic community would not prove equal to the challenge. And that if they failed, we should lose our greatest traditions of civility, the liberties Western man has won for himself after centuries of struggle and which are now threatened by a rising tide of barbarity. End quote. He would explain he did not find liberal Western democracy wounded, but rather sick perhaps sick unto death. In those dark years, it was unclear whether the liberal democracies of the, of the Atlantic community had the spiritual resources to win the larger struggle over the Western soul. It was unclear that they had the ability to defend themselves. Lippmann stopped writing the book when war came, and he would not complete it for another 15 years. The book is about the fate of Western and American civilization, and he wrote it in the faint hope that liberal democracies would learn to, quote, cope with the realities, end quote, of the 20th century. With so much at stake, and with such a grand and pressing subject, the book is a mass of confusions, as the author strains to make sense of so much, to explain to himself what he had missed before, and to persuade the educated classes of what they did not believe. The tensions, confusions, and the spiritual urgency give this book its power, as it exposes a very serious, very brilliant, very mature public and intellectual contending with the historical forces that threatened Western civilization. The groping of a secular man for a transcendental authority is, I think, important. In the 15 years prior to its publication, Lippmann concentrated heavily on foreign policy. In the process of working out a foreign policy for the United States, he found himself once again confronting the spiritual crisis that confronted civilization, threatened civilization. 
the most evident problem of, for the, with American foreign policy in the 20th century, according to Lippmann, is that it was governed by a, quote, liberal fundamentalism, end quote. By this, Lippmann means that out of the complex American tradition, political leaders had employed a narrow, reductive, bumper sticker idealism. Fundamentalism is a peculiar danger to democracies because a fundamentalist argument is simple, abstract, and morally certain, which gives it force in a democratic debate. Democratic politics do not encourage attention to details or complexity. From Wilson's declaration that the U.S. was going to war in order to make the world safe for democracy, to Franklin Roosevelt's four, uh, four freedoms, to the Truman Doctrine, and then by extension to the Bush Doctrine, American leaders define foreign policy not relative to our vital interests or our security needs, but to grandiose and selective appeals to freedom, undefined. Simplistic, abstract, and universal ideals that define our nation and its purposes tend to involve America in endless wars, this is still Lippmann arguing, endless wars in parts of the world that don't concern our vital interests. Moreover, the very thinness of self-definition self used as a demagogic tool to rally people to, call, to fight for a cause ends up diminishing ourselves, eliminating from our consciousness the complex, the complex accoutrements and accretions that come with the declarative statements. We pluck the flower and leave the roots. Now, I wish I would spend more time on this. This is really an important part of his argument, I think, is that it's not just that these ideas, stripped of their complexity, aren't good for other people. It's that we begin to think of those universal ideas in those very thin ways. So we change our ability to understand these truths in their complexity. And the further we get away from that, the more simple they become. Liberal fundamentalism was not, not, not only involves us in unnecessary wars, but it thins our public philosophy. Our first and our primary need as a nation is the preservation of our civilization, by which he means the preservation of our public philosophy, which defends our civilization. Fate, Lippmann wrote, has brought it about that America is at the center, no longer the edges, of Western civilization. In this fact resides American destiny, end quote. Put more starkly, the fate of Western civilization depends on America, and America's survival depends on promoting a healthy economic, cultural, and military alliance with the various members of the Atlantic community, who now constitute, he argued, the civilizational arc that radiates from American shores. As he noted, the Atlantic is the new Mediterranean, and those cultures in this community of nations are of cultural descendants of the ancient humanism that sprang from the myriad experiences of the Hebrews, the Greeks, and the Romans. Lippmann believed that Western civilization is a product, perhaps of providence, he's willing to admit that possibility, but clearly of great genius, great effort, and thousands of years of experience. The results are astonishing, he said. A civilization that respects reason and individual freedom is, is also a civilization connected to the highest human expressions of purpose and meaning, and to a compelling argument, he said, about the relationship between higher authority and individual autonomy and freedom. That civilization and the liberal political regime it produced cannot be transplanted easily to other parts of the world. It is a cultural species particu particular to a cluster of peoples and to a part of the world where such beliefs, habits, and values took root. Lippmann understood, I'm sorry, Lippmann's understanding of the highest objective of both contemporary American political philosophy and American foreign policy is the preservation of American civilization, not its exportation. Lippmann's idealism was connected to his affirmation of the good of Western civilization and not to a very narrow and promiscuous idea about the universality of democracy and individual freedom. If the fundamentalists sought to evangelize the world with a very thin version of Western civilization, abstracted from the very complex historical and existential sources, Lippmann argued instead for a foreign policy aimed at building the relationships that preserve the rich and complex patrimony of the West. Remember, this is a secularist making this claim. And if we take Lippmann's version seriously, then the United States, Western Europe, and other parts of the Atlantic community are risking their own cultural survival when they fail to cultivate properly the civilizational ties that bind them. Lippmann would have us be defenders of the faith, not evangelists. 
After years of thinking of the problems of, of civilizational integrity and international affairs, Lippmann returned to his book on public philosophy that he had hoped to preserve. He seemed unsure of himself and his ideas, sounding often like Richard Weaver, drawing selectively from people like Burke, Vogelin, Strauss, and nearly stealing from Babbitt. Lippmann, Lippmann never gained command over his argument, but he did expose the pressing questions that I think rightly concern us today. Western civilization is near collapse. That's how he put it. Liberty may not survive democracy. But what has changed? Lippmann argued that Western civilization had developed a public philosophy that held near universal intellectual assent in the 17th and 18th centuries. The intellectual and ruling classes affirmed natural law, whether through reason, as chastened by experience, or through theology. The most important elements of this shared belief was that humans are necessarily social and so belong to a particular social and political regime. Humans have private interests, but beyond those interests is a rational order superior to common law and accessible through reason. Good and bad, just and unjust are meaningful terms that rational beings can apprehend and understand. Thus, occupying a moral order, people have to sort out their lives individually and collectively in light of the truths thus discovered. Procedures meant to give particular expression to these abstract truths emerged through experience throughout Europe and America. Moreover, Western civilization produced what Lippmann called the traditions of civility. These traditions, more than anything else, function in Lippmann's work as tangible expressions of the accomplishments of Western civilization. The institutions and ideas that liberal Democrats love, popular sovereignty, property, freedom of speech, rule of law, liberties, plural, work only under the canopy of the larger public philosophy. And when the political arts and the social habits of civilization are inculcated into the each subsequent generation, these goods are cultural products. These particular goods are cultural products. Developed from experience, habit, and choice. Without them, Lippmann insisted, the natural tendency of humans to live intensely private lives without regard to the greater good would overtake them. The goods of liberal democracy depend then on one, understanding the natural law, and two, establishing the procedures, habits, and beliefs that allow one to live well according to the truths found in natural law. The Anglo-American model of developing these traditions proved vastly superior to those in the continent. The Americans accepted the broad outlines of the public philosophy, but largely eschewed any grand philosophical pretensions. As a result, the change that took place even the most revolutionary, near universal suffrage, evolved seamlessly in America from earlier generations. By contrast, what he called the Jacobin revolu democratic revolutions, the general term for revolutions in Europe, which were the norm outside of Anglo-America, uh, Anglo were motivated by desire to transform human nature itself. The demos could supply a check to this philosophical madness, but not if the people or the masses became alienated if their religious beliefs became doubtful, if their time-honored ways of making a living were destroyed, if the people became a mass. As one nears the end of Lippmann's book, one feels powerfully his fear of the masses and the raw power of democracy to act as an unchecked power. The only real check against the horrors that come from King Demos is the restraint of a public philosophy grounded in natural law. I hold that liberal democracy, wrote Lippmann, is not an intelligible form of government and cannot be made to work except by men who possess the philosophy in which liberal democracy was conceived and founded, end quote. But now, I'm sorry, but not only has this philosophy been battered by various forms of Jacobin attacks, but the context or environment in which we seek to maintain a healthy liberal democracy is radically altered. Lippmann concludes by wondering if we can revive our public philosophy in this new context following the Industrial Revolution, a time of rapid technological change, and this new age of mass democracy. He's writing in the 50s. Lippmann warned that, quote, if this cannot be done, then the free and democratic nations face, uh, face a totalitarian challenge without a public philosophy, which free men believe in and cherish, with no faith beyond the mere official agnosticism neutrality and indifference, end quote. The task was not a popular or democratic task. 
It belonged to various leaders who must revive the public philosopher in a way that allows those who are not thinkers or leaders to find themselves in a meaningful story. The object is to reinforce the habits of civility, to assert that our civilization stands for principles that transcend any one society or any single human institution. The object is to believe in the essential goodness of our society because it reflects, however imperfectly, the greater goodness of a transcendental order. So, can the West defend itself? Have the assets of modernity so eaten at the normative roots of our civilization as to make revival impossible? I find some reason for hope because I must. If much of the problem of the West, as I have argued, springs from a misguided idea of a universal society designed by humans and based on human knowledge, then we live in an age when the most dogmatically universalistic Western philosophy died, communism. This secularized and mundane eschatology collapsed as it was destined before the recalcitrant nature of reality itself. It is true that Europeans seem peculiarly vulnerable to moral nihilism in the absence of either a secular or religious eschatology, and that many believe that Europeans have long since lost contact with the complex cultural traditions that foster affection for what is theirs. Unable to believe in a universal truth or to love strongly what their ancestors gave them, Europeans have few resources to fight either a new wave of fascism or the challenge, challenge of Islam. This is the fear of many. Those who study contemporary European, Europe rather, can provide a better assessment and have provided a better assessment already of whether these cultural and spiritual resources still persist. It is not my area. But in the United States, long after Lippmann noted the corrosive effects of the acids of modernity, and long after he appealed for the revival of natural law and the larger normative enterprises of the West, we are a people who jealously love our liberty and who generally recognize that our freedoms and our rights are not simply declarations of our will. The tendency to evangelize, to take American forms of rights and liberties and government to parts of the world where these rights and liberties are ill-suited to the culture is most often a reflection of misplaced goodwill rather than something more sinister. The battle ahead for America is to focus American moral energies toward preserving a heritage of rights and liberties, along with a normative ground that gives it meaning. It requires a conscious effort to balance the universalism of American exceptionalism, natural rights, with the particularity of American exceptionalism. That is, these expressions and forms of rights emerged here for the complex reasons that we cannot reproduce the same way elsewhere. However seriously we take any outside threats to the West, the truly existential threat comes from ourselves and our ability to sustain a fighting faith in our Western ideals, a faith that defends without evangelizing. Thank you very much.